Well, hello, space friends. I'd like to present to you the Darwin class light cruiser, a Starfleet research and exploration ship inspired by the HMS Beagle, which was the ship that the scientist Charles Darwin sailed upon when he explored far flung places like the Galapagos Islands and led to the foundations of the theory of evolution. So here's my creative process for designing this ship. And space friends, I have to be honest with myself and all of you, I've never been great at just churning out clickbait YouTube content like a factory in the same way many other sci-fi YouTubers are. It just makes me feel a little bit dead inside. What I can do is be a bit more creative than most, and I'm learning that you all appreciate seeing this kind of content, even if it does take a little bit longer. So it's long overdue for me to give the Star Trek universe a bit more love. I wanted to do another reality-inspired spacecraft, very much like the P-38 Lightning-inspired Star Wars fighter and the F-14 Tomcat-inspired aerospace fighter that I did a while ago. And recently I've been annoyed with modern Star Trek and how removed from real science ideas it's become. So let's make a ship designed to seek out new life and strange life forms, just as Charles Darwin did in 1831. So let's go back to the original HMS Beagle, which was a 10-gun brig sloop constructed in 1820 by the Royal Navy. The term sloop in those days refers mostly to the military classification of the ship. So for example, a sloop of war was a naval ship with a single gun deck, and 10 to 18 guns, much smaller than frigates or rated ships of the line. Now brig refers to the ship's rigging and sails. Brigs were generally two-masted vessels, and what they called a ship back then actually had three or more masts. The Beagle was a Cherokee-class brig sloop. I find the class name interesting as it seems far more American than British. To complicate things further, the HMS Beagle herself was actually fitted with a third smaller mast in the back to improve her handling in tight spaces. Although this mast was much smaller than the other two, so we can still kind of call this a brig. The thing to keep in mind here is that these were not big vessels by any means. I like to believe that ships in Star Trek are most epic when kind of inspired by sailing ships. It tends to be either that or submarines. The challenge, though, is that unlike, say, a World War II ship or submarine, it's hard to figure out what the design analogs are that translate easily into Star Trek technology. So, for example, should mass perhaps translate to warp nacelles? Are we really going to put 10 phasers on this thing, just like the Beagle had 10 cannons? Well, we need to deviate a bit. I also decided to make this a motion picture era ship, perhaps not long after the signing of the Kittimer Accords and the new peace treaty with the Klingons in Star Trek VI. With tensions on the Klingon neutral zone cooling, we could say that Starfleet resumes a lot of its exploration missions. One thing's for sure, just as the original HMS Beagle could get into rivers and shallows, we had to make a Star Trek ship much lighter than the Constitution class and perhaps even give it a landing capability. The structure of the ship had to be somewhat more sturdy than a Constitution class ship for that purpose. So the first thing I did was remove a lot of the mass from the saucer section. This actually ended up being one of the hardest parts of this process as the saucer model was something I first made in 3D Studio Max many years ago. And it's nearly perfect, but now that I'm working in Blender 3D, there were many surface anomalies and quirks I had to fix, which took a while. Designing the secondary hull from scratch was much less frustrating. I think I kind of lost perspective, though, on what a Starfleet ship should look like. Perhaps my bias towards Romulans is a bit showing here. When I posted this concept on the community section of the channel, the feedback was less favorable than it should have been, so I modified the design. Rather than forward swept nacelle pylons, I swept them back, like the TMP Constitution class. Getting the hull to look less heavy than a Constitution class, while also looking something like a sailing ship's hull, was not that easy. Eventually, as you can see though, it began to come together. I wanted to make a long structure on the bottom where landing supports could be extended, and a relatively large shuttle or ground vehicle bay. Why not just use transporters like Star Trek normally does? Well, I'll come back to that later. But the saucer still didn't quite mesh with the rest of the ship right, so purely for aesthetics I cut it up 
many different ways and finally settled on this here. And then later, I worked to refine the lower hull to make it more sleek and modular like Starfleet ships of this era tended to be. I made a few adjustments to the proportion. This makes the nacelles a bit smaller relative to the Constitution class, and I'm okay with this. I will let the Constitution class have more warp power in comparison, but this ship will get more impulse power. This is my analog to the Beagle getting a third mast. We actually have these nacelle-like structures on the secondary hull as an additional impulse drive that can work more efficiently in an atmosphere or possibly even underwater. And then it was time to do the shaders and textures for this ship. My method is very old school, very much like for making game models. I decided to go all out on the details, all the way down to the Aztec plating as seen in many Star Trek ships. Of course, we must add self-illumination where needed, and finally, bleakies and beacon lights. And now let's get down to the ship's mission and capabilities. So the mission of this new class of starship is to study convergent evolution in the galaxy. What is convergent evolution? Well, it's a topic in science that I'm especially fascinated by. In real science, it is when two genetically distant species evolve virtually the same features, and this is often a result of environmental factors, even if those environments are completely separate. We see examples of this all across our own planet. The ultimate study or test of convergent evolution would be across different planets, which could be compared to separate islands or continent environments on Earth. Science Today asks the burning questions such as, since crabs evolved independently on our planet so many times, are crabs on other planets? I think probably they are. Or what about predators with praying mantis style of hunting which has evolved separately on our planet many times as well? And how would this adjust as the environment varies, perhaps in a lower gravity and lower light level? If you have a planet with say a much higher atmospheric pressure than Earth, could creatures swim through the air and would they look kind of like fish or manta rays swimming through the atmosphere? And of course, the ultimate question for us human beings, given a near-Earth-like environment, would tool users like ourselves evolve to be humanoid in appearance? Of course, by the time of Star Trek, many of these questions would be answered. However, the processes for this convergent evolution and all the environmental factors that affect it could be studied endlessly. And that is what the USS Darwin is designed for. The most prominent feature of this ship is the massive bay here. This is the shuttle bay, and just below that is a bay for cargo and ground vehicles. But why land this ship rather than just stay in orbit and use transporters? Well, first of all, unlike in most Star Trek, we should be a little bit more realistic about what to expect on alien planets. Landing a shuttle, or even better, a starship for added safety before deploying away teams on foot, allows you to understand the dangers of the environment. Rather than just beaming people down in the midst of any number of dangers, including weather, inhospitable terrain, dangerous flora and fauna, it's better to have the protection and utility of a ground vehicle or shuttle to make your initial surveys and have the mothership nearby. Never mind all the instances that make beaming dangerous, such as ionization in the atmosphere, fluctuating magnetic fields, and so on. You can also keep this ship on a planet surface for some time. The research labs are in this area above the shuttle bay. This is where the science teams live and work. There is a botanical garden here for science or as a crew amenity. Along the ventral section of the hull are compartments for landing struts. Here is the warp core emergency ejection hatch. And of course, we have the secondary impulse drive units, which use slightly different propulsion than your standard deuterium fusion drive system. This drive unit has intakes just as another option for better handling in an atmosphere or possibly even underwater. The rest is fairly standard as far as Starfleet ships go. There is a forward torpedo launcher here with a single tube, a navigational deflector here, and a rather sophisticated long-range sensor array here. There is a port and starboard side travel pod docking port here. This is not too far from engineering. These dark hatches on various parts of the ship are for escape pods. 
Moving up to the warp nacelles, now these nacelles are similar to the motion picture Enterprise, but smaller. This ship is not quite as fast at warp, but not particularly slow either. A Darwin-class ship might follow the longer-range exploration cruisers as they discovered planets of interest. In fact, perhaps a Darwin-class would have been much more suitable for studying Genesis back in Star Trek III. Once the Darwin arrives, it may stay at the planet for weeks and possibly months. Moving up to the saucer section, now I made these modules on the saucer section mostly for aesthetics, but they need a purpose. I did not want them to be even more engines or thrusters since the ship already has plenty of those, so I've decided to designate them as SIFE modules, or Structural Integrity Field Enhancement Modules, a somewhat new technology for the era. If shields and dampening fields are not strong enough to keep the ship intact in rough landing operations, the SIFE modules can be used to compensate and keep the ship's structure safely intact. I'd like to speculate that this is a relatively new technology. We hear the term increased power to structural integrity field all the time in the TNG era, but not much in this era of Star Trek. As such, these early SIFE modules are large and bulky compared to the better integrated ones in the TNG era. And of course, shield grid lines are present in the outer hull. The shields on this ship are relatively good and can be shaped to enhance landing within an atmosphere. And finally, the ship features the same short-range sensor modules we see on the ventral part of the saucer, as seen on the Enterprise, Reliant, and most Starfleet ships of this time, as well as the very same bridge and officer's lounge area on the top of the saucer. Alright, I feel I should mention that in some ways this starship design could be compared to the USS Titan as seen in Star Trek Picard Season 3. It seems as if the producers and artists of the new season of Picard have the same idea I do when it comes to the TMP era aesthetic. Now, Space Friends, this video took much longer than expected to produce. My videos in December didn't get the views I was hoping for, so this video is kind of an artistic reset of my content. When I do a ship like this, I show progress on the community section of my channel, which will show in your feed, especially if you are a subscriber. And your, com and your comments on these works of progress certainly do influence the creative direction I go. So be sure to subscribe if you want to get in on the next project. Until next time, space friends.